Forgive the length of this message. This is the first and possibly the last time I'll have access to a computer, so I thought I'd better write this all down while I can get it to those who should know. I'm leaving town. I don't know where I'm going. I just... I'm just getting as far away as I can. Okay, so as some of you may know, I took out a loan and opened up my own auto shop a little over a year ago. Business has been going decently. Well, I can't complain. And I've always been grateful to all my customers who would come to me exclusively when God knows there are so many already established places in town. I've been doing well enough that I was able to hire on my buddy Neil a few months ago. He's been working hard and helping out real well, as I always knew he would. Well, I needed to take a day and go to Lamar's class at Rebecca last month, and so I entrusted the shop to Neil for the morning and most of the afternoon. That's the day I think everything actually started, because when I got back, he seemed to be in a stupor and was covered in oil. He even had some smeared across his face, as if he'd tried to drink it or something. I told him to go home and clean himself up because we had no clients at the moment and I could take care of anyone who came in for the time being. He came back 45 minutes later, but he was still much quieter than usual. He worked as well as he ever did, but something just seemed off about him. I asked him if anything happened while I was out and he just shook his head. I asked how many clients we had and he just muttered something unintelligible. I asked him to repeat himself and he turned and glared at me for the briefest moment. I could have sworn his eyes appeared to be completely black. No iris, no sclera, just utter, all-consuming blackness. I stumbled back and bumped the shelf, knocking things down. When I looked back at him, he was still looking at me, but he didn't seem to be glaring hatefully the way he had before. He just seemed kind of out of it. Just a couple, he answered. Some woman and then a tattooed biker type looking dude. I assumed one of them must have asked for an oil change and that's when he spilled it. So I asked if he had any trouble and he simply shrugged. I looked around the garage while he was gone and I saw no traces of an oil spill. So whatever had happened, he must have gotten it all on himself and none of it anywhere else, miraculously. But he seemed reluctant to talk about it, so I didn't press the issue. And we worked on throughout the day. That day and the next went relatively normal, other than him still being awkward and quiet. I asked him if he'd like to go out and get us lunch while I tended to the shop, and he said, Sure. When he came back, I was busy doing a diagnostic for a client, so he put the food on the counter in the office to wait for me, and he went ahead and ate. I finished up with that customer, and we'd have to keep her car overnight to figure out just why it kept dying on her. So I asked Neil to give her a ride home, and then I went to grab my food. He bought me some Chinese food and a nice tea, so I opened the soy sauce packets to pour some over my food, and I noticed the strangest thing. It was as though the soy sauce was a living thing, somehow spreading out like dozens of squirming inky black maggots. When it fell into the fried rice, it buried itself inside. I took the fork and started to scoop out the rice to look deeper inside, and small, smoky tendrils would rise from the rice occasionally and dissipate. I was incredibly hungry at that point, but I was way too creeped out to eat that, so I chucked it and the iced tea in the garage. I decided I'd just wait till I got home that evening to eat something I'd prepare with my own hands. I'd never in my life seen anything remotely like that, and I couldn't even fathom how I'd ask Neil if he'd noticed anything similar. As cold and distant as he'd been lately, I was sure he'd look at me like I was Looney Tunes. So. I just shut up about it. That Friday, we went down to the old watering hole, as we always do to get some drinks and watch the local bands play. And Neil was just as quiet and distant as he'd been all week. He's not a bad looking fellow, though. And so despite him not going out of his way to speak to anyone, 
a woman went over to where he was sitting and started talking to him, and they ended up leaving together that night. Monday morning I tried breaking the ice by asking how his weekend went. He gave me a nod and muttered, Alright. I asked him if he got lucky with that young woman I saw him with. He gave me the smallest grin, which was quite possibly the first grin I'd see on his face in a week. And he said, It went well. I didn't pressure him for details. I knew he'd share if he chose to. And his small grin was enough to assuage my worries and lend me some hope that he might get back to his old self soon. The day was relatively busy until about 3 p.m., so I finally had a spare moment to sit in the office and listen to the radio while I waited on the next client. So there I was, leaning back in my chair with my feet propped up on my desk when I swiveled around and looked at my bulletin board that sits behind my head, with all manner of clippings stuck to it. I had a few Sunday comic strips such as Garfield and Calvin and Hobbes that I'd read maybe a hundred times since I'd opened that shop. But that day, something was different. The first panel seemed normal, but in each subsequent panel, inky black tendrils crept out from the edges of the frame and from behind the characters. Blood dripped from the ears and eyes and sometimes even the noses. And in each of the strips, one of the characters would say, He comes. I sat staring in astonishment for a moment before I realized the tendrils were moving ever so slowly and then each of the characters' heads turned ever so slowly towards me, and I threw myself back away from the bulletin board, sliding over my desk and onto the floor. I ran out to the garage and yelled for Neil. I could not be the only one to see this. To my surprise, he had gone, and so I hesitantly walked back to the office and peered inside. The comics were still corrupted, but they no longer appeared to be moving. I crept over to it and reached out to pluck one of the comics free when I noticed the inky black tendrils started to sweep across the page towards where my fingers were at least three times as fast as they moved before. I jerked my hand away. Nothing good could possibly come from letting that blot of ink touch my skin. Of course, I ripped the entire bulletin board down and burned it in the trash can out back and never spoke of it again. That night, I went home and my wife was already in bed, fast asleep. My mind was racing and I couldn't even bring myself to eat dinner that night. With no one to vent my worries to, I fell into a restless sleep and kept awaking to nightmare after nightmare seemingly every hour of the night until I just gave up on sleep entirely. That Friday, I went to the bar again, even though my wife couldn't drink being pregnant and all, and Nia wasn't really any fun to hang out with anymore. None of my other friends could seem to be reached. I just needed to get a good buzz and I'd start feeling better, I reckoned. After downing a couple beers, I excused myself to the restroom and I noticed I was more inebriated than I estimated. So I leaned over the sink to splash some water onto my face. And that's when I heard it. Like a sheet of fabric being dragged across the floor, a voice rasped ever so quietly out of the drain. It sounded like a prolonged exhale for the longest time, until I finally recognized the words hidden amongst all those vowels. <sighs> Cracks appeared in the porcelain, snaking out from the ring around the drain. At least, they looked like cracks, at first. But after a few seconds, I recognized them as the same tendrils of corruption I'd seen in the comics earlier that week, snaking their way slowly along. I stumbled backwards out of the bathroom door and right into someone's chest. I turned around and stared up in the pitch black eyes of a six and a half foot tall biker, with tattoos covering every piece of exposed skin besides his hands and head. I stumbled quickly away from him, and his evil, piercing gaze followed me as I retreated to the bar. It felt like a dream, or whenever you're running for your life, it feels like running through quicksand. As I walked across the room, I noticed the biker wasn't the only one staring at me. It seemed every pair of eyes in the place was focused on me, and more than half of those eyes appeared to be perfectly black, with no hint of iris or sclera. A few lips moved, and though I couldn't hear the voices over the sound of the jukebox, I could easily guess what they were saying. He 
I didn't get a wink of sleep that night. I haven't been getting much sleep for the past couple of weeks as a matter of fact, which I'm guessing those of you who spoke with me recently could have guessed. I keep seeing those pitch black eyes staring at me. I'm afraid everyone I see will turn and whisper those words to me, staring deep into my soul with that evil glare. Every time I go near a sink or go to grab a bite to eat, I'm afraid I'll see those inky, snaking tendrils squiggling towards me. Even my wife has seemed cold and distant lately. Then tonight as I'm driving home from work, struggling to keep my eyes open so I don't drift into oncoming traffic, my cell phone rang and it was Rebecca. She was on her way to the hospital to have our baby, and for the first time in two weeks I was actually happy. She was in the labor room strapped to a monitor when I got there. Watching for her contractions, she barely noticed when I walked in, but didn't seem startled when I sat down beside her and took her hand in mine. I tried talking to her, but she was unresponsive, and I was so tired I didn't even realize I started to drift off to sleep until the nurses came in and started moving her into the delivery room about a half an hour later. I put on my scrubs and a hairnet and went in with her to hold her hand and coach her through like they'd trained us in Lamaz. When she started cursing and screaming, I was prepared for that, as well as her ever-tightening grip on my hand. But when I saw the movement in her tummy, my mind started to reel. The doctor said the baby was crowning and told her to push. I echoed his orders and she screamed at me with a voice I couldn't begin to describe. When I looked down at her, she was staring up with me with those same eyes I'd seen on the biker. The same eyes I thought I'd seen on Neil weeks before. I tried to jerk my hand away but she maintained her grip. Black tar-like blood splashed the front of the doctor's scrubs but he seemed to pay no heed. When I looked at her tummy again, black veins seemed to stand out beneath her skin, pulsating. She continued to stare at me, and she was no longer screaming, just grinning, those obsidian eyes boring into me. To look chaos. She breathed in a raspy voice. The one who is behind the wall. The doctor continued as he stared down at my child, my child lying silently cradling in his blood-stained hands. He looked up and raised the baby and appeared to be covered in oozing inky black liquid, much like that that had covered Neil a couple weeks prior. It did not cry out, but it was alive, and it moved when he held it up. When its eyes opened, they were as black as my wife's, as black as the doctor's, in unison. They all breathed his name. I ripped my hand free of my wife's iron grip and stumbled out of the room, barreling into the nurses passing in the corridor just outside. When I stood up and looked back into the room, I could see the inky black tendrils seeming to extend from the doctor at my newborn across the floor where I stood. I turned and ran down the hall to the elevator and slammed my finger into the buttons. When I looked back, the tendrils had come into the hallway, yet no one else seemed to notice until it, until it slithered over their feet and up their legs, at which point they abruptly stopped, turned, and looked at me with those same obsidian eyes. I abandoned my effort to call the elevator and broke into a panicked run for the stairs. I ran down the 15 flights of stairs all the way to the lobby, tore ass out into the parking lot, hopped in my car and started driving. I didn't know where the fuck I was going. I had to get the fuck away from there. I don't know if I'm going crazy. It certainly seems like it, but, but I just can't be around anyone I know anymore. They all have those same eyes and those same dead stares and even my child, oh my god, my baby. I saw those eyes staring at me from the cars beside me and by some strange coincidence, the same biker from the previous Friday night at the bar pulled beside me an hour away from the hospital and followed me for nearly two miles. He'd turn and stare at me grinning. I couldn't see his eyes through his sunglasses this time, but. I knew it was the same guy. His tattoos seemed to move on their own free will. The flaming skull on his right bicep began bleeding from its eye sockets. 
As soon as I could, I slammed on my brakes, allowing him to fly past me as I swerved to my left and did a U-turn. I think I lost him. That was an hour ago. I'm at a motel three hours out of town. The first place I've found that has Wi-Fi. And I'm tired, and I'm shaking, and my hand itches where my wife's nails scratched me open. I honestly don't know what to do, or who I can turn to. This story will sound insane, and I'll probably be institutionalized, and I'm not sure that wouldn't be the best thing for me, but I just can't bear to look into those eyes anymore. Every time I see someone new and they stare at me, I start to panic because I know, I just know, it, it, it's out there, looking for me, whatever it is. And even when I lay down and start to drift off to sleep, I hear those words, he comes.